this section we call historic climate change essentially because we are now getting into the time scale where there are historic records of various type whether it's written documents cave paintings etc to look at how climate has changed and how it has affected uh, civilizations which is very relevant to in the context of global warming because we are always worried about how global warming will affect human beings and of course the other species so africa is kind of the center of many of these ideas essentially because we know using molecular and genetic techniques that the human beings essentially evolved somewhere in eastern africa before they migrated out into colder climates and far away into other continents over time and uh, that happened of course over several million years and the whole time the tectonics of africa has been changing a little bit and the climate has changed a little bit and we'll see that climate has actually played potentially key role in the evolution of human beings themselves so climate change is not necessarily a bad thing it's just how it happens how fast it happens how it affects us and the other species is is critical so this story as it grows we will get more and more into more uh, some specific processes like el nino for which we will have to bring together our understanding of ocean circulation the winds and the phrases we used before like air sea interactions will become clearer so as you prepare this course you will have to uh, supplement the information on climate change with some of the fundamentals from ocean circulation how the ocean waters are getting cooled and heated and what that means for global warming and so on so as we go along it will become uh, more and more clear so let's touch a little bit upon human evolution we know from various fossils now that somewhere around 10 to 15 million years ago the old world monkeys and new world monkeys so the ones that originated in africa and uh, the ones that had settled in other continents began to kind of genetically diverge it's called speciation and somewhere around 5 million years ago the evolution of ancestors of modern human beings began to emerge over africa from the primitive apes like chimpanzees and and gorillas and so on so the theories of why this happened and what are the most critical differences that first evolved and then may have led to series of uh, evolutionary changes along the way is uh, very critical so we'll look at that and the earlier ancestors that emerged from apes of course were australopithecus ardipithecus and and so on and it's unclear whether the so called bipedalism we walk on two legs whereas most of our ancestors uh, the primitive apes walk on four legs which is called quadrupedalism so by pedalism which means walking on two legs versus quadrupedalism and whether that had something to do with climate change and how that affected the connection between the skull and the spine and whether that affected the growth of the skull and eventually the growth of the brain and so on a lot of hypotheses but n- not necessarily any uh, concrete proof okay so the brain size evolution then becomes critical which relates to opposable thumbs which makes us more ambidextrous symbolic language which means i can stand here and explain something that doesn't even exist for example like let's say something that uh, looks like a mango but tastes like a jackfruit and is bigger than a mango but smaller than a jackfruit such a thing doesn't exist but just using all the knowledge you have you can begin to imagine something like that so the human beings are very unique in this kind of symbolic language which evolved and we don't know exactly how it evolved how the language itself evolved and so on 
And at some point around three million years ago, the speciation happened in a way that our ancestors, like Paranthropus, split off and then the Homo lineage evolved, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, Homo neanderthalensis, and so on. So let's look at the things. How did stone tools begin to come along? If that had something to do with having opposable thumbs and brain function that is higher than other animals which use stone tools, there are monkeys and chimpanzees which use it, but they just have been using it the same way, which is called vertical learning, which means they have genetically inherited some traits which allows them to crack hard nuts with a stone or drop it from the tree and break it. But we continuously improve things and evolve things. So we have what is called oblique or horizontal learning where we learn from friends, we learn from teachers, we even learn from people we have never met, like let's say reading from Steve Jobs' book or Einstein's stories and so on and so forth. So the evidence of the early hominins, that's a kind of term that's used, hominin and hominid, which means human-like. The footprints appear somewhere around 3.6 million years ago where the volcanic ash has frozen and fossilized the human-like creatures walking around. And our relation to early mammals is pretty clear now using various genetic techniques and so on. And just to look at the timelines, Australopithecus existed around 4.1 to 3.1 million years ago and the brain size was 400 to 500 centimeter cube. And Homo erectus, who was one of the first handyman building a lot of tools and so on, existed around 2.4 to 1.8 million years ago. And if you remember your climate record now, 1.8 million years ago is where the Pleistocene started and we started to have these ice ages of 100,000 years. Before that we had more like the obliquity cycle of 41,000 years. So does that have something to do with this change? We are not always sure but there are some theories we'll look at. So the brain grew larger, 800 to 1,000 centimeter cubed and Homo sapiens arrived in the geologic time scale literally on the large, uh, last fraction of a second. So if you think of the evolution of Earth and life as a 24-hour clock, we arrived just at the very last few fraction of a second uh, close to midnight. And the brain size is now quite big, 1100 to 1500 centimeter cube. This has all kinds of consequences when you are growing up. Most of the energy goes to the brain metabolic rates of brain are very high when we are growing up and learning everything from language, walking, taking all audiovisual cues and becoming grown up. And as an adult, it should take about 25% of the energy if you are using your brain properly. So putting that in the context of the time scales again, so the our ancestors like gorillas and chimpanzees, some evidence begins to evolve about the bone structure changes and so on. And so you can see here various details like Ardipithecus ramidus, Australopithecus afarensis, Anamensis, Kenyanthropus, and so on and so forth. And there is a split where the Homo lineage begins to evolve. And in the end, in the modern times, other than our primate relatives like chimpanzees and gorillas, we are the only lineage of hominins or hominids remaining at this time. Lots of theories as to why some of these disappeared, like Neanderthals. They had a big brain, they were used to cold climates and so on, and there is evidence that there was lots of interbreeding happening between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. We carry, all of us carry some fraction of Neanderthal genes and so on. So climate change has played a role in this. Even if you look at the large migration that happened around 50,000 years ago out of Africa, the so-called out of Africa theory, seems to be related to impacts of glaciation. We were in the peak of the last ice age and Homo erectus also traveled pretty far. And imagine the things that drive these kind of explorations. Basically, glaciation means cold temperatures, drier climate, maybe reduced food supply, so 
sea level changes also allow crossing seas that may not be possible before because the glaciation drops the sea levels and creates these new paths you can cross and so on. So things would have been difficult to, to survive in Africa and maybe migration was made easier because of changes in sea levels and so on. So there is evidences of unstable climate along the way as several species came into being and disappeared and here we are at the very, very end. And so you can see how long some of these species survived and should give a sense of what is our future. Have we come, uh, become so intelligent and so powerful that we will survive forever? There are nice evidences of how we ourselves are evolving since we came into being around 79,000 years ago. Various features relates to diets, climate, etc., the nose shapes, teeth sizes, etc. There is all kinds of um, evidences. So one of the most critical thing is to explain how bipedalism evolved. Why is it that quadrupedalism is among present among chimpanzees and gorillas still, but we started walking upright, we meaning our ancestors. So the best hypothesis we have is called East African aridification. Aridification means drying. So East Africa got somehow dry and I will show evolution of vegetation and you can see that somewhat here. So the vegetation went from woodland to more of grasslands like this, very few trees with lots of savannas and steppes and grasses and this is the our uh, ice volume. You can see that there was a different frequency up to about 2 million years ago and then in the last million years we have had this 100,000 year cycle. So what role did these things play? There are speculations that this reduced rainfall and change in vegetation from lush green forests to wide open grasslands like this happened because of the African continent rifting and creating these so-called highlands which began to change rainfall patterns or because Australia moved and blocked the connection between the what is now Indian and Pacific Ocean. So remember we said Australia is moving northward at about 3 centimeters per second which means during this time it would have been much further south which means there was a more direct connection between what are now Indian and Pacific Oceans that would produce a very different climate over East Africa than when you block this pathway and create this uh, warm water flowing from the western Pacific into the eastern Indian Ocean. So this change presumably required our ancestors to run faster to avoid being eaten by lions or being attacked by some other animal and also go further to find food because in a lush green forest you would have berries and fruits and nuts and so on plenty around but now you have to go further and it turns out that when you walk upright it is much more efficient. So walking on four legs is not as efficient as walking on two legs and in fact endurance also goes up. So you might think horses run so fast but actually human beings can run forever and the horse will get tired and die. So there are men who can run for 100 miles for example. So endurance means the ability to keep going also increases and the theory would say that when you walk upright the connection between the skull and the spine changed in such a way that the skull was able to grow larger. The other theory says that we used to eat uh, hard meat and rough vegetation which required strong jaw muscles but once we started using fire to cook or eat uh, naturally cooked by forest fire and so on, food that is naturally cooked, these jaw uh, muscles released and that allowed the cranium to grow bigger and the brain grew to fit into it. Nonetheless, these are hypotheses because it doesn't explain everything about how language evolved, how we began to get 
smarter in building tools and so on and so forth. A very fascinating uh, books on it that you can you can read, uh, which will be put in uh, the resources. So again, corresponding to the changes in the ice ages and the, the cold and the vegetation, there are dust signals and pollen signals and so on and so forth. This is relevant because even now the climate over East uh, Africa is changing on the historic periods. So right now if you look at the vegetation, there are lush green forests where the ITCZ and the African monsoon happens, the so called West African monsoon and this is now a desert and there is a transition from the green forests into woodlands, shrublands and grasslands into the desert. On this side you have these, you can see these are basically it should be the elevations. There is African highlands here which kind of in fact steer our monsoon winds coming into India. So you have much reduced rain here, so you have lots of grasslands and this is where our ancestors and bipedalism and so on evolved. We can figure that out by looking at genetic linkages of people who live there versus people all around the world. Now if you look at the location in East Africa in this place going from the south to the north across the equator, so going from about 5 south to 15 north in East Africa, going from about 15 million years to the present. You can see that before during the ice age, remember 15 million years ago, what was the climate? You will have to go back and, and see. And there was open woodlands, monsoons evolved, Himalayas got formed, Indian monsoon got set up, African highlands were not there which came into being a little bit later around 5 to 7 million years ago. You would have had lush green forests, there is evidence from pollen and uh, lake sediments and so on. And slowly around 5 million years ago, things began to change and by the time 2 to 3 million years ago, the vegetation had basically changed to arid steppes, decreases in trees, increases in grasses and so on, something that looks like this. Okay? So that is confirmed from all the evidences we can find. So we are still very far away, not historic period, but we will come towards historic period with the background because we are now thinking about what will happen to human beings as we go into global warming and so on. So what caused the climate change? As I said, one of the theories is that the African highlands evolved and that changed the pattern. The other one says Australia moved northward and blocked this pathway which changes the temperature here, it changes the El Nino here, changes the rainfall here and so on. And if you look at the geochemical evidences from ocean sediments from this region and this region, it shows that somewhere around 2 to 3 million years ago, the temperatures that were close to each other between the east and west began to become very separate. So this upwelling and cold sea surface temperatures evolved around 3 to 5 million years ago. This is called Pliocene, Pleistocene transition. So this is the Pliocene here. So if temperatures are similar across, it is like what happens now during an El Nino. So that is typically referred to as a permanent El Nino. During a permanent El Nino, right now if you look at what happens here El Nino, during El Nino, more rainfall than normal occurs in East Africa. So if you had a permanent El Nino, the idea is that there would be more rain and that would explain the vegetation like this. But if this got blocked or whatever happened that led to the trade winds creating an upwelling here and cold temperatures. Then you changed the sea surface temperature gradient. We will see that that gradient corresponds to high pressure and low pressure. That gives us winds going this way which means we will see that there will be more upwelling here. So you have kind of a feedback. But during an El Nino this water sloshes this way and it gets warm here. <clears throat> that changes the whole tropical atmospheric circulation as well. It is given in 
Walker cells and Hadley cells and there are separate modules for those that you can look up. So essentially that would give you different kind of climate here. So the current conditions evolved in terms of this contrast and El Nino becoming more episodic instead of being in a permanent El Nino state. Now El Ninos happen every 2 to 7 years which means the rainfall increases here only every 2 to 7 years. Most of the other times it is fairly dry or arid compared to before. That is what is East African aridification. If you look at the other evidences here, those temperatures have remained similar over this time, but they have cooled because when you have winds blowing here, you will also cool these temperatures. Okay? So that is kind of consistent with this permanent El Nino kind of theory. So today's climate is basically that there is colder temperatures here, warmer temperatures here. We will come back and see it in the context of El Nino again. So during a permanent El Nino, you would have reduced that temperature gradient and made the winds weaker. If it is low temperatures here, there would be high pressure and low pressure. In this case, the pressure is lower, so we will call it H prime and it would be higher than here, which we would call L prime. So the gradient will change, the wind strength will change and that will further reduce the upwelling. So you will have this kind of positive feedbacks which will maintain a very different sea surface temperature gradient across the equator. We will re-emphasize these concepts when we come back to El Nino, but you should begin to get used to the idea of combining everything in terms of trade winds, Coriolis pushing water away from the equator, creating upwelling, that water being pushed this way and being piled up here because there is a coast, it cannot go any further to the west, so it will heat up. So that is what gives you this kind of east-west contrast. It is very similar to the Atlantic as well, whereas the Indian Ocean is different because it is got a monsoonal circulation. So you can see that the Atlantic is similar, Pacific is similar, but the Indian Ocean is different. So we will come back to again, this figure looks more complicated than it actually is, but we will come back to that. But it is showing something very critical that also becomes very relevant to global warming. What is it? Looking again at the current distribution of sea surface temperatures, upwelling and cold temperatures and piling up and warm temperatures. Associated with that, cold temperatures means no rising air, no rain, high pressure. High pressure means nice weather. Remember, so if you go to Galapagos here, temperatures are always very cold, but there is upwelling, so nutrients come up lots of phytoplankton, so there is a lot of biodiversity on Galapagos, right? It is famous for its biodiversity and the temperatures are so cold that the northernmost penguins are actually found on the Galapagos. North of Galapagos, you do not find any penguins. So the rainfall distribution is like this. Remember, this is kind of what we call the ITCZ. This is called the southern South Pacific Convergence Zone or SPCZ, SPCZ. This is more complicated over the Indian Ocean. The ITCZ moves north-south with the monsoons. So we will see that later on. One additional complication we will introduce here is upwelling and cold temperatures occur because of winds generating this ocean dynamics and bringing up cold waters, then the atmosphere tries to heat it. So these are surface heat fluxes which means how much heat is going into the ocean or coming out of the ocean. If ocean dynamics cool the sea surface temperatures, then the atmosphere is trying to warm it. And that is good news. Why? Because whether it is global warming or just regular heating, the ocean can take up heat at places where the ocean dynamics is can bring up cold waters. So it is like a sponge that is soaking up the heat. It takes the heat by the Gulf Stream and the Kuroshio into latitudes where the air is colder and it will release the heat there. This release of heat here is critical because that warms the atmosphere and that creates evaporation that gives us meridional overturning 
and deep water circulation and so on. Here there is no deep water formation right now for various reasons which we will not get into basically because arctic waters coming here through the Bering Strait create very, very fresh waters which are not heavy enough to sink. But in the past there is evidence that this circulation had changed and there may have been at least some heavier water formed that did not sink all the way to the bottom, but it sank below the surface. And of course, there is monsoon circulation here which produces coastal upwelling as we saw where also the atmosphere tries to heat the cold ocean. Why is this important? Basically because this is the kind of balance. There is heat going into the ocean here and heat is going out of the ocean here. So, on a long time scale there is a balance. Ocean is moving heat and it is gaining heat and losing heat. So, obviously if currents are moving heat towards the poles part of the energy transport we need based on the equator to pole temperature gradient. What happens if we change any of this? Let us say we grew ice here and prevented this loss of heat from the ocean to the atmosphere. To restore the balance basically you will have to reduce the amount of heat taken up by the ocean, which means the winds have to weaken and reduce the amount of cold water being produced by upwelling. So, this is kind of a slow time scale change. Some change happens here which is related to orbital forcing for example, or tectonic changes which covers the ocean where the ocean wants to lose heat and it cannot because there is ice on top which means ocean also cannot take up heat anymore which means the ocean circulation has to adjust, the winds have to adjust. Why is this important? Because under global warming we will come back and see that if ocean continues to produce cold water here, the global warming heat can keep on going into the ocean. If global warming reduces somehow this heat going into the ocean, then it will reduce this, but overall it will reduce the amount of heat that ocean can take up. Remember we said ocean takes up 90 percent of the heat from global warming, but if this change happens then we could be in trouble because that means global warming can begin to get amplified and the atmosphere can warm more rapidly because the ocean is not taking up the heat anymore. Just to keep that in mind, let us now come back to some of the issues that may be there in the way we interpret brain size. Just to as a caveat, it is possible that the brain development uh, happened not just in jumps, but during a certain period there were multiple scales evolving. So, at any given time the brain size could have gone increased in size over this range, but when we sample we could be sampling on this end or this end and be over interpreting how fast the growth happened. It is just something to be aware of. It does not affect us in any way right now in our climate change discussion, but sampling is always an issue. But nonetheless, just to kind of conclude the brain story, if you look at the weight of the brain versus the weight of the body for various species, this is called allometric scaling. There is a separate lecture on this that you can look at. This is as opposed to isometric scaling. What is isometric scaling? If you look at two spheres, two squares, two cubes, the dimension changes by the same amount in every direction, whereas in allometric scaling they change differently, which means when we are a baby the head is relatively bigger. As we grow up the head does not grow as big as the arm or the, the lungs or the legs and so on. So, they all or the heart they grow at different rates, the si dimensions change differently that is called allometric scaling. So, in biology we depend a lot on allometric scaling of various things. So, this body weight versus brain weight shows that uh, 
mouse which is very smart and used for many experiments is quite smart and human beings are way off this line where most animals stay. So even elephants and whales which are very big so their brain is large because they are big animals but that doesn't mean they are necessarily as smart as us because our brain size relative to our body size is much bigger. The other thing we should remember is that now we can do what is called a social brain. In other words, we can collectively develop many ideas, invent things, work together and discover things, which is a good thing and which is a bad thing because this also gives us things like mob mentality, spreading rumors, etc. But nonetheless, we have ability to work as one brain at a large scale by working together on projects and so on. That's kind of the brain story. The stories, the historical evidences of human evolution comes through many evidences like this cave painting which looks almost like modern painting which has been interpreted to correspond to evolution of agriculture, changes in climate, plowing um, and so on and so forth. Early human beings were living in northern Asia with domed dwellings. You can see they probably used the bones and skulls and ivory, the tusks and so on of the animals they hunted. So they knew how to remain warm in regions where the climate was probably pretty cold. But along the way you have had many stories like this where civilizations have disappeared. It's whether it's Mohenjo-daro Harappa or the Mayas, the Incas and so on. So we'll, we'll keep coming back to this. And it's always curious to see whether climate played any role in the extinction of or disappearance of these civilizations. Suddenly they would boom, grow to a big size, survive for many a, a long time. So the Mayans existed from late pre-classic going back to about 2000 years to early and late classic periods and then they disappeared somewhere around here 800 to 900 years ago. You can call it before the common era. Usually it's referred to as common era. Before we used to call it before Christ and uh, Anna Domini and so on. But now more accepted terminology is common era just to make it more secular. So here is the post-classic period and you can always look for evidences like this which shows the Delta O18 record from the Yucatan Peninsula in the Gulf of Mexico which shows that some kind of enrichment of Delta O18 which means remember it's somehow getting colder so the O16 is being locked up in the glaciers and O18 is being left behind in the oceans. So there is cooling which typically means drying. So drought probably knocked off the Mayans. So now we are beginning to link climate changes that we have looked at to human plight or human destiny. And these are again time scales which are suborbital. They are not related to tectonic changes or orbital forcing. They are related to some other things which we will see as we go along. The other evidences go back a little bit further which relates to the so-called Noah's Ark and the flood that is described uh, where Noah built an ark and saved the animals and so on. So a couple of people from uh, Columbia University, Bill Ryan and Walter Pittman proposed that during the glacial period the sea level dropped and the link between so here is the Mediterranean going into the uh, towards Italy and so on. Aegean is the Greek region. Sea of Marmara and Black Sea were probably separated because the sea level dropped. And as glaciation began to come to an end around 7600 years ago, some ice probably was left there. This started to get flooded again and this ice dam broke and created a giant waterfall. So you have to be always careful reinterpreting religious stories and narratives but nonetheless there seems to be some climatic evidence that the great flood described in the scriptures may be related to the deglaciation uh, process. There is now lots of fossil evidence to show that during the uh, glacial maximum 
not only were homo sapiens and neanderthals running around and neanderthals went extinct only about 25000 years ago that's very very recent we don't know exactly what happened but there were many animals like the woolly mammoth uh, saber toothed tiger which uh, we cannot find here and giant ground sloths and so on so there were many extinctions along the way and evidence shows that that was not related to climate change in many places wherever human beings went and established themselves in different continents the extinction of the large mammals and megafauna uh, typically relates to the arrival of human beings and we'll see that next so you have pulses of extinction appearing in various evidences that are still being dug up in various parts around the world and this is a complicated looking map but let me explain so it is basically showing causes of extinction in red whether it's humans blue whether it's climate and a, this kind of a beige color i don't know what color this is it's where we don't have insufficient data brown color let's say okay so very interesting things to be found here if you look into north of africa into the mediterranean and european region human beings arrived only about 30000 years ago africa they have been there for more than 160000 years in north america as far as we know they only arrived at the end of the last glaciation around 10 to 12000 years ago and in south america they probably arrived 10 to 15000 years ago so the changes here would have led to migrations of all sorts and woolly mammoths in these regions disappeared only about 5000 years ago and so on so what is amazing about this figure is if you look at the number of extinctions of species that we can guess you know based on all evidence at the best of our ability is that only about 8 species disappeared in africa even though humans have been around for 160000 years over europe humans have been around only for 30000 years but nine species disappeared if you go to australia causes are most certainly human they have been around only for uh, for about 45 to 70000 years from the best evidence we can guess 21 species disappeared north america 33 south america up to 50 so we won't worry too much about climate impact so here is large climate impact glaciation here is mostly humans here we are not quite sure not quite sure um and here it's most certainly a uh, human habitation so the curiosity is of course if human beings have been around here for so long the longest of all continents how come the extinction is minimal here that's a good question for you students right it turns out that human beings and all these animals co-evolved over this period many species like the gazelles and grazers and horses and equids and so on they all evolved with climate change vegetation change monsoon change and so on so when species evolve together they don't necessarily see themselves as threats to each other so they coexist better than when they go into a new continent find animals they may not have seen before and begin to kill them or begin to kill them for food because they haven't established agriculture yet and maybe it's not suitable for agriculture because australia is largely a desert and so on so those are the kind of issues that tell us that lot of the mass extinctions or pulse pulses of extinctions that have happened in the historic period mostly relate to human arrival human settlement and it produces curious cases like this where coevolution actually minimized the deadly interactions between humans and the local mega uh, fauna okay that's interesting so this is kind of uh, interesting story that we will come back to and continue building towards the holocene later and later into the holocene towards the industrial revolution and we will learn many processes along the way so 
the take home points before stopping is that climate change over East Africa, the so called East African aridification may have been a very critical impulse for evolution of hominids or our human relatives in terms of especially evolution of bipedalism. Not every step is explained in terms of the evolution lang of language, brain size, our ability to use our hands and build tools and so on. But climate change obviously has played a part and as human species have colonized the world, they have created lots of perturbations to what existed before and that kind of continues into global warming. And we will see that all life uses energy and life pollutes. So, we use energy and we have gone from uh, natural wood and so on to coal and to, to petroleum and gas and we produce lots of pollution, greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide which changes climate and that is what will lead us to global warming and then we will look at the, the evidences that exist for global warming and the causes, but we will go through this systematically through historic climate change. See you next time.